This morning we have a very serious subject and one which I think no one can handle in even a few days, let alone a few hours. But it is something I think we must all think about in the future. We took as our subject the love of God. Now let's consider this a little bit in the light of the way things are in the world. Look around us in the 20th century and we probably will find one of the most terrible periods in the history of the world. There were others that were bad, but the resources involved were not adequate as they are now. Old wars were not plagued with nuclear weapons or microbic uh, gases and so forth. They were not troubled, troubled with airplanes and all kinds of devices for terrifying and injuring people. So we have hung up a record. The 20th century is probably the most barbarous century in the history of the world. Now we look back and we see the Greeks fighting the Romans and all that type of thing, or we consider the Crusades and we begin to feel a little more comfortable. Perhaps we are growing a little. But when we go back and get all the statistics, we're not growing much. We are not doing anything to develop the moral integrities of contemporary civilization. We are not doing anything to protect the integrities of the coming generation. We are constantly focusing our attention upon destruction and profit. And these are the only considerations which are assumed to be necessary to the civilization of a people. Actually, as we look around us, we see the ruins of many great enterprises that might have had meaning. We also see a few outstanding corruptions that are succeeding only too well. And with all of this, we are supposed to be a God-loving or God-fearing people. Actually, we do not seem to be either. The old days when we were really frightened by the promises of divine wrath are more or less forgotten. And those who are most guilty do not even believe in divine wrath. We also look back with certain apprehensions upon our own growing up and the kind of world we are giving our children and who is going to be in the 21st century when it comes. Certainly, unless there are marked changes, it is not going to be heralded in with a blast of ethics or anything of that nature. We look around us and we listen to these various commentators and we study the analysts and we read the more recent text on the subject and we find almost completely the real factors ignored ignored because they would interfere with the continuing stream of procedure which has become sacred in this century. Sacred to profit, sacred to pain, sacred to death, but not sacred to the plan of human destiny. Therefore, it is very important for us now to study a little bit about morality. And in order to touch on morals, we have to touch on religion. And when we see the condition of, of morals today, we may say, what has religion done about all this? Well, essentially very little. The contributions of religion have been in, on television, television programs and on some sermonizing and in a few crusaders going out. But the major stream of religion has not been enriched. We have in the world today nearly three billion committed persons committed to some type of faith, uh, to some ideal, to some integrity beyond materialism. If these three billion people cooperated, our problems would be very few. We could control almost any situation if these people would practice what they talk about. But instead of practicing, first of all, they divide into sects. 
and we are confronted with a very unpleasant spectacle of the same people all over the face of the earth worshipping the same God but under a different name in every square block. We are here in a world where we have no definition of deity but countless interpretations of deity. We each believe that our particular faith has this special admiration of deity. But we do not know what the faith is and we do not what, know what fascinates the deity. We just keep on going. Now a religion, as it says in the Bible, is something in which you dedicate your life to a principle or a purpose. If that is true, economics is our God because we are dedicating our lives to it from the cradle to the grave. But it certainly isn't religion because religion is not the dominant factor in the lives of people today. It is here. It is struggling. It is being interpreted, misinterpreted, and corrupted, but it is not leading the public. It is not doing the things that a religion is supposed to do, opening the doors of the future for a better way of life. It should carry with it integrities, justice, and mercy, the forgiveness of sin, the arbitrations of war. All of these things should be part of religion, and not any of them has been successful in assuming or affirming this fact. We have peoples of two different religions at war with each other without nearly knowing what they are fighting for. We have great masses of people who have been for years deprived of all religions, breaking through the shells of materialism to seek again a godly way of life. And when they find it, what will they have? What they had before. A life that did not lead them into truth in before will not lead them into truth again. If we are going to move from materialism to religion, we're going to have to do something with the religion also. We're going to have to make it applicable to the needs and problems of human beings. Religion is probably the highest and deepest of all of the dedications of humanity. It is more widely diffused than any other single factor. Yet very little is done in the name of it to solve the problems of life. We have money to buy new planes to carry atomic bombs. We can spend billions on armament. We hear nothing about solution by way of intelligent dedication. Now what is religion to us? Religion is faith in something beyond ourselves. Faith is the recognition that there is some purpose beyond barter and exchange for the existence of mankind. If this is true, it has been overlooked. We are now living in a completely secular world with a few religious trimmings. We have a number of beautiful churches. We have some magnificent old cathedrals from the days gone by. We have the ruins of the temples of a hundred gods. But these various remains of the past are not casting a long shadow upon our present activities. Where is religion going to come from? Where should we expect to find it? There has been very little record of direct contact with the divine power. Such records as we have are mostly contained in the scriptural writings of mankind. From these writings we gain a certain pragmatic understanding of certain of the forces of nature. But most of these scriptures are based upon cause and effect and upon daily experience in living. Scriptures are the long record of human experience struggling with the problems of existence. But we do not at the present time have anything to consider as adequate to our need. We can go to church, and probably those who do should. And maybe those who do not should also. But when we leave church, do we leave it a better person? Do we go to church on Sunday morning 
uh, convinced to the fact that we're going to renew a friendship that was lost before Sunday night? Are we going to do something in the name of faith to prove that we have some? Or are we going to go home and turn on the television and wait for the next Sunday for another uh, brief uh, exchange with secular matters? We are not doing anything in particular. Now, why are we not doing anything in particular? Because apparently from the beginning it was assumed there wasn't much to do. In other words, no one really believed that people were going to change to the degree that we hoped they would change. They've taken it for advantage and for granted that the materialist can go, materialist can go to church, but he'll still be a materialist. And the theist goes to church and he will still foreclose a mortgage on the widows and the fatherless. There is no way, apparently, in which we can expect religion to compete with business, with the hard problems of profit, of that last dollar we can get out of somebody. And yet here we are a civilization that has been building and working for thousands of years to create a better way of life. We come to the most advanced century in the history of that world and we're not getting a better way of life. Why is, the, why is it impossible, apparently, for the individual to live up to the basic moralities which he affirms in his faith? There are at least seven major religions in the world today. Five of them are really big and the other to our moderate. But each of these has exactly the same teaching. They call it something else. They don't call God God, they call God Allah or Brahma. But they're talking about precisely the same thing. And they're talking about it to the degree that this God, under the, another name, teaches the same morality, the same ethics, the same idealism. It warns of trouble resulting from mistakes. It warns the follower to avoid sin. It warns the world to avoid materialism. These things have been going on for a long time. The world is full of people who have acknowledged or do acknowledge the reality of a spiritual reality above materialism. And yet, nothing happens. The young are on narcotics. All of the uh, others are doing everything possible to accumulate a few dollars to leave behind for their descendants to argue over. Why is this? Why do we have today a civilization advanced in everything except learning how to live well? Not only not learning how to live well, but not even learning how to die well. Nothing seems to be happening to touch the inner life of the individual. Everything is on the outside. He has his Phi Beta key, but he's in jail for smuggling. He has all kinds of gifts and, and accomplishments. He has a good education and a terrible marriage. He also has a family of very well-educated people, and most of the children are on pot. Why is this this way? Why do we call this progress? Well, it's the only thing we have that looks different from the rest, so we call it progress. But it is nothing but bad matters getting worse. So what do we do about all this? We have to go back again to what we're talking about, God. Now, God to the average person is a very abstruse and abstract and very subtle factor in our existence. Many people have heard about it from their ancestors. Some have heard about it from a great television evangelist. Most of those who have contacted it are leery because of the economic pressures that are now being passed off as religion. So we have no real sources for faith. And we have no real contemporary institutions. Now, suppose we consider the ch these church seminaries that we do have. Those seminaries have been here for a long time. Are they doing something? Have they made a step forward? Or as seminarians, have they simply graduated a few more preachers? I was in Chicago at one time when one of the great football games was being played. This game was between a parochial college and a secular college. 
It was a tremendous fight. I was in the same hotel with the uh, parochial crew or team and all of its assistants. In the course of the three or four days they were there, they got a bill for the, from the hotel. The kids got a bill from the hotel for over $300,000 worth of damage. And on the Sunday morning, uh, several of them uh, were arrested uh, by a raid when they were pilching boxes of cigars from the lobby. This was education. And it's still going that way. What is wrong? Why do we not learn something from the past? Why do we not at least learn something from our own ancestors back two or three generations who were more worthwhile mostly in most cases than we are today? They might not have been so brilliant. They may have had to work hard with their hands. They may have had to raise their children in the country on farms. But there was still in them a certain humanity which is gradually disappearing. Humanity now is a covering. It is a case that you put on, but underneath it, there is no real humanity. Because humanity is reaching out to help those who need. Humanity is sparing lives and not taking them. Humanity is giving opportunity, not destroying it. And humanity is to make the best use of resources, not waste them on vicious and destructive things. So we need to get a new understanding of God. We've got to get a God that gets out of all these buildings and gets into us where it belongs. Each of us lives because of a divine spark within us. We were born with this spark, and no matter what we do, it will be there till we die. But for the most part, it will not waken during our lifetime. It will remain as it was, a potential of humanity. Now we have this problem in very sure and certain faces today. We have got to do something to find the way to the development of a different form of faith for the 21st century or we'll be nowhere at all. One thing, one thing that may happen that could help would be the gradual breaking down of sectarian boundaries. But even these will die hard. The individual is proud of his orthodoxy rather than of his ethics. He is very happy to belong to a certain thing and glad that he doesn't belong to something else. All of this is foolishness. All of this is part of an old superstition that should have died in the 15th century along with the, the various um, inquisitions that disfigured that period. What we want now to recognize is a way of changing our approach to religion. Now, if you've traveled, and I have traveled partly, at least, reasonably, you will find scattered about the surface of the earth some of the most beautiful buildings that man has ever devised. The great Comacene builders and the cathedral builders of Europe have left us works of dazzling beauty, works of splendor, works of tremendous integrity and with great symbolic meanings. And who, who is in them? I've been in many of them. Mostly there's someone in there raising some funds. That's all. Sure, the Mass will be shown. But this great building stands for a great principle. It, is a, it towers above the trade hall and it towers above the secular city. And it is the wonder of that community. And people come from all over the world to see it. That, but what does it do? What is it giving to tomorrow? Some of the most beautiful churches in Europe were bombed out during World War I or II. Others are practically deserted. Some are closed. Some are condemned. And some have been changed into stables and storehouses. This is very, very wrong. It is something we cannot afford to have happen this way. It is necessary to just get hold of some of these things. Now, what would make what would might make a mother or a parent a little concerned over all this? Possibly wayward child. But at the same time, the wayward child is probably worrying over the uh, waywardness of its own parents. 
There is no integrity here that is learned. There are good parents, but there are many who have no more interest in being good parents than they have in being good citizens. They are there for what there is in it, and the sooner the quicker. So we have to find some common denominator. And we like to take a thought now. What is the Chinese concept of this unit of society? And the answer is the home. The home is where morals are built and where morals die. Homes are where unity rules supreme and diversity eats away all that is valuable. Homes are something that are kept not for a generation, but for many generations. In the old palace home of Confucius in China, there are the moral tablets of 50 generations, all preserved, because they represent a great stream of moral force. Confucius is not recognized as a great scholar primarily, although he was loved for his scholarship. He was admired for being a good human being, one who really tried to live the principles that were just and right. And so everywhere, the home, basically, is the unit. As Confucius says, so goes the home, so goes the empire. So that the beginning of religion in the modern world is not in the church but in the home. If it's not in the home, no church can make up the difference. Nothing can meet the vacancy left by a faithless family. It is something that belongs to a world bigger than ours. It is the right of every child who comes into this world to know the comfort, the security, the consolation of faith. Without this, what does he have? What can he do? He can go out into a world of shysterism and sink with it. Or he can try to behave and be a martyr for those who do not understand him. So the beginning is of the home. And where then does the teaching come from? The parents, the grandparents, the great-grandparents, and remotely from the Son of Heaven himself. Actually, therefore, the parental pattern is probably the most perfect pattern of religion. It is not something that is simply creedal. And as time goes on, creedalism will probably diminish. We now use keeping creeds alive when they do nothing but kill each other. Therefore, there will probably be greater and greater personal emphasis upon the religious content in daily life. We can expect the 21st century, therefore, to emphasize the importance of the home and of the family as a source of unity and strength. And we know that Mencius followed this same idea and that the mother of Mencius, to protect him, made several moves and changes in her life pattern just to make sure that the boy was always in the presence of the best. The uh, proper thing for us to think perhaps a little about, instead of how, what reform school to put these children in, to get hold of them and give them the light and truth that they need. I know some parents who have tried it, and it has worked wonders. And it produced one or two miracles. It converted a few parents, which was something in itself, that they should decide. As they made better children, they would become better selves. And then our whole problem of religion. God is therefore another name for the integrity of life. It has something that has to do with the light, shining light of a reality, of something that pays off in plus instead of in minus. And we find that in the old religious writings, the deities were mostly borrowed from world heroes. The, in the very old times, the uh, God was nothing but a glorification of Louis the Sixteenth. He was simply a deceased ancestor who made good. 
they built an ornament for him in the form of an altar and kept an offering on it so that he wouldn't get angry at him as after he became a ghost. He was a symbol of the family. And be, the family in those days was very largely patriarchal. Most of the gods of antiquity were men gods. They were gods because uh, they were the heads of clans. They did, died, died and remained heads of clans. And the stronger ones got better. In Egypt, some of these clans grew, others disappeared. A god that couldn't take care of his own clan soon disappeared. But always the deities were the heads of the various social structures and were constantly venerated and catered to and memorialized simply because they were former human beings. Now this is true in many religions of the world. And in other religions it is similar but not quite the same thing but derives from the same general concept. Namely that in the beginning the gods were the heroes. They were the ones who in one way or another uh, be became great. And in the course of time this greatness came to be associated with religions. And nearly all of these gods ultimately brought a doctrine. A doctrine which was just exactly what the people wanted. A doctrine that justified what the people wanted to do. And that after these doctrines were established, then the problem was to perpetuate them. And in the perpetuating of them, we find this strange motley crew that we have today. The whole world divided into a checkerboard of beliefs a little here and a little there. These beliefs in substance much alike, but each with certain prejudices, certain commitments, and certain intensities of believing, and very few realizing that from the beginning on the whole theory was encompassed with one wall and that all of these various religions are actually aspects of the same thing. Out of this past conflict conflict there has been very little new added for the, the last two or three thousand years therefore we say that if you worship Allah you really have to go on a holy war against Brahma or if you believe in Moses you have to go into a holy war against Zoroaster all of these names become frightfully important the fact that they all taught the same thing and that we're not doing the thing that any of them taught doesn't seem to bother anyone. It just, just doesn't seem to annoy. Zoroaster died with an assassin's dagger in his back. Muhammad was poisoned. These things happened to all these teachers. But for some mysterious world reason that is hard to explain, names make differences when names are only problems in language. Therefore, 90% of the names given to deities interchangeably now are derived from language roots. The same thing in the familiar language of a people. Instead of talking about the 72 gods, we are talking about the 72 names of one god. It's rather important to discover this. Because if we do this, we will begin to recognize the possibility that we can outgrow religious provincialism, that we can get over this blessed problem of how to remain noble and belong to the church. Actually, it doesn't make much difference which one of the churches you belong to. It's very difficult for the average person to remain noble in any of them because he does not bring them into his life. There is something out there on Sundays but they're not something that's there when he finds he can add a few dollars dishonestly to something he is selling or buying. This is the, this is the problem we have to figure. But always considering the fact that the, the, the deity is a family, that the various aspects of the family's beliefs are in the names of these various religious deities. We can say to ourselves, if they're all the same except for the names, why do we make so much difference out of them? Well, we make difference out of them because it is 
profitable. It is very profitable. It helps somebody to get an extra dime. It does something to get hold of something better from one person and take it away and give it to someone else. These differences of names have no essential for you when if you say honesty and list all the individuals who are honest, the names don't amount anything. But if you pay no attention to honesty and list them all, most of them will be dishonest. <clears throat> it's one of these problems that we all face <clears throat> and we have to face every day. So, here's a thought. Supposing we do what some have thought would be a nice idea. Restore the idea of the home as family. If we do that, then then the love of God becomes a restatement of love of parent. If a parent deserves love and gets it, this is religion. If a parent is sincere and honorable and brings up children properly, that person is pious. That person is really spiritual. That person is living the life of improvement. All of the trimmings, all of the association, all of the big buildings are not much of it. The much of it is, are we taking care of these people as God intended us to? Are we true to the things that are real? Are we true to the values that we must live by if we expect to live at all? Now, as uh, we know this also, the majority of these ancient deities, practically all of them, are male. Why? Because male was the hero. And there were many justifications. It's not just arrogance. The male had to be the protector. The father of the house has value as well as the mother. It is the duty of the father to protect the house. And it is the duty of the mother to enlighten the children. It is the, parents, the du duty of the parents to see that the child is protected, educated, and enlightened, and sent forth as an accredited human being. Now, if this is true, that becomes also religion. Now, religion can extend beyond this, but religion that doesn't live at home is very hard to live anywhere else. A religion that does not make the average family forget its feuds and differences, stop arguing over which sect they married into or married out of. Let us forget all of this type of thing. Let us forget also that old agnostic uncle or whoever he may be, anything. The problem is that the unit of life for the future has to be created by the individual himself. The idea that we're going to pass laws that are going to make us honest isn't going to happen. The fact that we're going to get all enlightened at once is very doubtful. The fact that we are going to depend on politics and economics and business ethics to get things straightened out is still more remote. They're, they've got a lot to work on now and haven't even made a start. Therefore, we have to go back to the simple fact. This world is made up entirely, in human terms, of families. It is made up of families of many colors, varieties, and languages, and faiths, but families. And each family is an autonomy in itself. Each family has the right to live well, regardless of other families. No family is supposed to be enslaved by some other family. If the family lives its own life morally and ethically, brings its children to maturity as dignified human beings, if it teaches honesty, idealism, and integrity to its children and bestows upon them the love that children need in order to live well, then we have a religion. And the individual who lives this way is worshipping. And the worshipping person is the one who shall see the face of the beloved. It is time, therefore, for each person to trace his faith back to his own heart, not to something someone says about him, not to some shortcut to nirvana, but back again to the depth of himself. 
If he does this, he will find that the world has given him a marvelous assortment of possibilities. There's no reason why he has to be like everybody else. The only reason is that he must learn to like everybody else. He must give up saying, this man is a different religion and I can't speak to him. I've had in my time many, many cases of young people of different denominations whose lives have been ruined by the incredulities of their ancestors. As a minister, I have married a number of couples who could not find any other uh, form of marriage that had a touch of anything but the justice of the peace. These people had no crime. They loved each other, but they were of different faith, which made them incompatible as far as the family was concerned. All of this has been going on for ages. The desert is filled with tribes that raid, raid each other. The cities are filled with corporations that cheat each other. The world is full of schools that teach things that nobody really needs to know and teach nothing that is important. All these things must be changed by the 21st century. If they are not changed, our projects are going to be very, very poorly represented. Therefore, I think it might be very well to understand that the real worship of God is, is the worship or recognition of the unity of life and the proper training and education and development for that purpose. It is one thing, and perhaps useful to some way, to read of beliefs from the tables of Hammurabi written 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. Very interesting. Even there they said if a, a builder made a house that wouldn't stand up, he should be penalized and asked to build another. They got to that point, at least, in, in development of ethics. But the real answer to the point is always that daily, hourly, and now, the time is very, very right for us to begin to think in terms of the love of God as a process of recognizing and rewarding the streams of essential integrity which flow down through the ages. We should begin to think more and more deeply of where honor is due and refrain from bestowing it where it is not due. Now, among other points that are very interesting is the possibility that is emerging at this time of the consideration of deity as feminine rather than masculine. This is gaining considerable recognition now because it again ties two roots. The, uh, the uh, idea that life goes back to the great mother becomes more reasonable to some people at least than the way that it goes back to a father. There is something about the mother that is representative of the giving birth itself to integrities, to values, to guarding and selecting and keeping, to disseminating the truths and principles of our life going forward always toward the, the development of all that goes after. That these key people, and every family has them, should be developed in this way. My wife is working now on a study of the possibility of developing the, the importance of the mother descent in the hierarchy of, of religions and in the hierarchy of creation. But regardless of how we approach it, the fact remains very definite that with this new century coming, we've got to do something about it. Or our, the, the, our civilization will simply exterminate each other. We now are approaching gradually two forms of extermination. One is through the develop of, uh, development of destructive armament, which cannot be uh, prevented from working havoc. This armament has advanced far enough, according to some experts on the subject. It is conceivable that a bomb can be invented, put together, or imagined one way or another. One bomb that will destroy all of civilization. Now, we certainly hope it won't happen. But how in the world can a people consider itself intelligent that contemplates such things. Where can we find a person 
in his right mind who would want to advance any project which meant infinite destruction, misery, and death. On the other hand also, we have another group, uh, the environmentalists. This group is quite convinced that if we keep on, we will live on nothing but the edge of a desert. That everything that is, makes life important will go because we will wear out the resources of the planet. And so cheerfully we announce this on the top of the page and down halfway through the same page a big ad for a new product that has just cleared out several hundred acres of forest to make it. No one pays any attention to these things. No one seems to think of education as teaching us how. Why does education not teach young people how to think through the facts of their own existence? Why do we live to drift along on the surface of something? We're not getting anywhere. We're not even comfortable. Every so often we have a new epidemic or a new terror arises among us for which we have no solution. We are making life more difficult every day and no profit. And yet no one seems to be taking this matter seriously. You can read pages and pages and pages of uh, congressional reports here or something from the British Parliament or something from the French House of Deputies. All of these things, all of them pointing out the need for something important, but all of them passing into the uh, lost and found department and left there. Why is it that we're coming into the new age, the new generation, that we do not think more about God? Why do we not realize that we are in the midst of an infinite intelligence, infinitely diversified throughout infinite time? an infinite space. The nature of this we do not understand and may never understand. But through its symbolisms we begin to understand the reason for existence, the reason to make our existence better and to realize that the power of this eternal principle is passed on generation after generation through the families, nations and races that inhabit the planet that we are here in the presence of tremendous opportunities, tremendous values, infinite responsibilities, but we are here to do something besides watch television after 10 o'clock at night. We are here to do something with life. We are, we are perfectly entitled uh, to have a, an occasional baseball game if we want it, but we also have the right and proper to do a little serious thinking once in a while. We are all the worse for not thinking, every one of us. And yet we do not desire to think. Because think, as one man told me, would, be, would ruin his life. If he thought, he couldn't do what he pleased. As long as he doesn't think, he can make the mistakes that he enjoys. Of course, he doesn't think what the final mistake is going to do to him. And it always does. There is no one that gets away with any of this. And yet in youth they think they can. It's like the individual with the present problem of narcotics. Here is a world of crime serviced by many nations and by persons of every age to help to kill off humanity. Is this the best we can do? Is this the reason why we have had great opportunities is this why we have been given wisdom? We have been given understanding and insight? Is it all in order that we can simply eat ourselves to death or drink ourselves into a coma? Why do we have to think it this way? Why not face into it really the way it is and admit that if we're going to make the next century any better than this century was, we're going to have to do something about it that's worth doing or it never will be. We cannot continue the way we are at the present time. We've got to go on to a higher level. And as the book says, it's got to begin with me. It has to begin with us. It has to begin with a parent who is perfectly willing to let the child go out anytime and anywhere. It is the, it's got to go out and do as it pleases. Because if it fusses, it'll annoy the parent. In our day, people, parents weren't annoyed that way. 
they had a rather quick way of annoying the child instead. <laughs> and the child generally stayed annoyed for a few hours. And may maybe be several days before it would try another experiment. <laughs> Here, no one bothers because it gives the parent a headache. And they rather they would uh, tell the child to go out and do as it pleases and they'll settle back with a couple of aspirin tablets. This is the way things are going. Why? Because for one reason, the world is being made more and more unattractive to thoughtful people. The world is no longer a great source of inspiration, a so great source of hope. The God that we have in the atmosphere around us now is a God of fuss and fuzz. Things that do not much mean, do not have any essential significance. And yet over it all, in it all, above it all, is a living, eternal power. The power that we call God. God is this infinite power. And it is a power that is intelligent. It produces from itself every art and science that we know. It produces every theory and every attitude that we hold. It is the source of our good and the source of our corruption. It is a tremendous potential that is given to us to do something with. We are here to take the power of God within ourselves and use it to build a world where human beings can live like gods in peace together. This is something we've got to try to work for. This is something we must to try to build into our consciousness. So that actually, love of God is actually love of law and order, love of truth, love of beauty, of patience, of kindness, of forgiveness, of peace. These are the things that belong to love of God. And every time we say we love God, it must mean that we are defending the great truths of life by which we will gradually come to a great destiny. Now the 21st century is another opportunity. If we treat it as badly as we did the 20th century, there's some question of how long we're going to last. And yet, the Homo sapiens erectus human being regards himself as the noblest of all creations. He is the kingpin of everything that nature has produced. He is the soul of greatness, but he, has, he doesn't do anything to prove it. He just goes on being great with a stupid superiority atmosphere, but he's not doing the works of greatness. He is not finding solutions to these arguments between countries. He is not finding solutions to the problems of life. He is not recommending strongly and firmly that all these nations obey their own laws and obey their own religions. The religion of the world is, let there be peace. And the religion of the world is, of the Lord loveth those that keep the law. These laws are not obscure. There's nothing mysterious about them. The early church found them out. St. Francis the Assis supplied them. St. Thomas Aquinas was a great exponent of them. These laws are simply integrity. They are keeping the rules of human relationships. They are doing unto others as we would have them do to us. We ha they are actually only a great code of the proper use of an eternal energy potential. As long as we use this wisely, we will keep on building futures. If we disobey these rules and corrupt the substance of nature around us, then we destroy ourselves. And when we destroy ourselves, it will not be because that we were overcome by the Philistines. It will be simply that we were overcome by the lassitude, latitude, and indifference of our own natures. Therefore, it seems we should start worshiping God. Worshiping God may be with a nice little prayer each day. It will do no harm. A prayer would certainly be appropriate where there are children. Otherwise, a silent meditation. And then, to put on a kind of garment of chivalry, maybe a little like Don Quixote de la Mancha, and go out to do our job of lancing the windmills. Let us go out and find something 
that needs doing. Something where an injustice has been done. Something where thoughtlessness has taken over. We will come face to face with an opportunity to do something for others instead of forever for ourselves. And in that moment, when with unselfishness we make a sacrifice for the good of a person, stranger or friend, former enemy or former friend, in that moment we worship. And until then, we do not know the true God. For the God that is the God we love is our own love for God. And the love of God begins in ourselves, in the recognition that within our own natures is something that has come to us from eternity. The power to do good, the power to be right, the power to ease pain, the power to strengthen hopes and ideals, the, the power to end forever the petty differences and the ambitions of tyrants. And the modern historian can prove to you conclusively that all these tyrants came to a bad end. And why are we so anxious to join them? Perhaps it is because, like Mussolini, we would rather live a few years as a liar than live a long life as a quiet human being doing good. Ambition probably has something to do with it. But there's no reason why we can't have the ambition to be right. There's no reason why we cannot be ambitious enough to use more wisely the endowments that have been given to us. Ambition does not have to be fulfilled in the conquest of empires. It has to be fulfilled finally in each individual's conquest of himself. And until that is done, there will be no peace. Now we're going to start pretty soon. We need a complete remaking. We need to have involved into our educational system a sure and clear statement that we all live from a divine energy, that we have no definition for it actually, that we have no way of understanding it completely, but we know that it is something that rewards good and punishes evil. That it is something that grows and enriches those who serve it and impoverishes those who cross against it in any pursuit of any kind. We can start out with a re-educational theory in which all education is founded upon morality and ethics. And all morality and ethics are arts and sciences that have been given to us so that we could love God, that we just could understand God better, that we could use the power of God for good instead of corrupting it for selfishness and destruction. It would be wonderful indeed if we could all dream together that in the 21st century we will end forever the reign of selfishness and put in its place the true democracy of the brotherhood of mankind. Thank you.